what would you uh, tell an IMG who is interested in cardiology how to make their application competitive enough to uh, match and mix? Yes, so cardiology has been has been competitive, and um, you know I think it's going to remain competitive no matter when you apply. And I mean, if you were to ask someone, maybe. So I applied now for cardiology fellowship now. I, I can't believe this, but it's like like almost twelve years ago. It's unbelievable to me that this this much time has passed, um, and it was competitive then. And when I was applying for a cardiology fellowship back in twenty eleven. Um, you know, my mentors were telling me that it was competitive even for them and they were attending physicians. So I think it always is going to remain competitive, which I think is good um, because, you know, competition um, fosters growth for the field, growth for individuals, growth for everyone. Um, I think um, for for foreign graduates, um, again, you have to have the, the capacity um, and the the focus to tune out all the external voices and sounds and noises and focus on your inner voice um, and the strength of your inner voice. And if the inner voice is strong enough and it's telling you that you have it in you enough to be able to uh, go through the, the the rigor of the match process and and you know get into a competitive cardiology fellowship position, you know, like yourself at the Mayo Clinic, then you should you should believe in that. You should believe in yourself more than anyone else. You know, that is that is the number one, you know, advice. I mean, I think it's a general life sort of um, mantra. You know, you have to have the faith and the courage to listen to your own inner voice and have, have, have belief in yourself. That is one. I think the second advice would be uh, you have to understand how the you have to understand the rules of the game. I mean, if you're playing a game, then you have to understand the rules of the game so that you can you can play it well and then you can master it and, and then you can deliver, right? Because we can talk about philosophy and we can talk about belief and strength and all of that is is very important as a foundation. But then when it can, when it when it comes down to you know boots on the ground, sort of the practical nitty-gritty of things, um, and then you have to understand the rules of the game. You have to understand that it is a competitive process. You have to understand that, um, you know, there are limited, um, you know, spots for, for fellowship training. And you have to understand that the only way you are going to be competitive is if you uh, contribute to the field in a meaningful, positive way. And if you are um, genuinely asking questions which will help the field move forward. Um, and if you have it in you to take up on projects which um you know you um feel are are important and i've read uh, and i've understood uh, in, with the help of a mentor that these are important projects and that it's important to do them for the field to move forward then you know these projects you should have the discipline to finish them write them up present them as well as publish them um, because that's what you do projects for you do projects so that you can publish them and it's important to publish them so that you can share it with the rest of the community and rest of the world. And then that changes how you do things, that changes how you manage patients. Um, so if you have the, the drive and the discipline and the capacity to do that, that's what program directors are looking for. It's like, okay, he's a very good clinician. So you have to be very good as a, as a house staff or as a resident in managing patients and taking care of patients and making sure that you are completing your clinical tasks on time. That is your primary job as a practicing clinician. But then when you're applying for a competitive fellowship like cardiology or, you know, maybe like gastroenterology or even hemonc, um, you have to identify questions which are important and you have to immerse yourself in clinical investigation. And you have to have the discipline to finish those projects. Um, and then so that you can put them on your yeah. resume and you, know, you can demonstrate that, you know, this is what you've done in addition to uh, being in a in a clinically busy residency that that speaks volumes of the drive that speaks volumes of your true interest in the field um i think as an accompaniment to to projects I, I think it's also important to identify a mentor who you know has um demonstrated um success with mentees who has also demonstrated success with uh, you know identifying projects which are important 
to move the field forward and it was demonstrated success in getting them published. Uh, I think a lot of a lot of the residents sort of fall into the trap of identifying a mentor, uh, not having researched the mentor as much as well. Um, because, you know, again, time is limited, you know, time is of essence, time is money. Uh, and if you are giving your time to something which is that important for your own future, I think you have to do these sort of, you know, these background checks, for lack of a better word, and your homework well, so that you are investing with the right person, investing in the right project. You know, at times, even if you invest with the right person, um, that project for some reason does not land in a, in a high impact journal, that, that's fine. I think it's important for you to be convinced um, and for that person to be convinced that, look, this was an important question to answer uh, and that you have done everything well from a methodological standpoint, right, uh, to um, deduce the the correct answer for the question that you, you asked. And then, you know, wherever it gets published is fine. You know, as long as it's peer reviewed, it's indexed on the National Medical Library and it's um, it, it answers a, an important question at the bedside or in the clinic or in the ICU. I think all of that is fine. Um, one one more thing here is that a lot of us, uh, in you know, who come from outside are not exposed to basic science at all. I mean, I wasn't at least, you know, in my medical school. Um, and you sort of have to understand that if you are taking the path and, you know, there are fellowships who offer uh, you know, the, the translational scientist pathway or the clinician physician scientist pathway. And I think a lot of those pathways are for basic scientists uh, and, and translational scientists. I mean, there may be now pathways for, you know, people who want to do outcomes research. Uh, I'm sure like Mahi has, has such a pathway and, and that, that, that is fine. But, you know, a lot of the traditional clinician scientist pathways are bench to bedside pathways or pathways involving basic science. And you have to be very clear. I was very clear at least that, okay, look, I am not a basic scientist. Um, you know, I will, um, I will never be a basic scientist. I mean, I'm, I'm a clinician and I will have to identify projects which um, are important to the patient at the bedside. And, you know, I will do my best to answer those questions clinically and get them presented and get them published. Um, so I think these are important points as you are um, honing your resume for a competitive cardiology application. Get to know your mentor really well uh, and identify mentors who will then pick up the phone, write emails, um, you know, have networks net nationally so that you can, you're can you casting a wider net. Um, and then my, my final uh, recommendation or suggestion here also just based on my own experiences is to just apply widely. Um, and that is, you know, uh, my my program director at the time who told me that there is this ten is ten is to one rule that for every ten rejections you should have one interview, <laughs> and maybe you need like ten interviews to for a successful match. So you can do the math. That's like a hundred programs, right? Um, so and you know a lot of the American graduates when you tell them because you're friends and you're like you you're crazy you're applying for hundred to hundred programs, you know they may not understand the competition that is stacked against you compared with someone, you know, from their background. And that is totally fine. You know, it's, it becomes a level playing field when all of us become cardiologists, but I think it just takes time to get there. Um, yeah, I think those would be the only ones. You, you, you spoke about mentorship uh, and I had a question about that. Uh, personally, I initially, when I came here as a resident, I struggled with like, finding a mentor or a sponsor. What advice would you give an IMG uh, to find effective uh, mentorship? Yes, and I think, um, you know, in, I'm, I'm speaking both as a mentor as well as a mentee, um, you know, from my experiences of having sought mentors, uh, which I still do now, um, and, you know, also mentoring, um, you know, IMGs or even, even American graduates. Um, I think it is uh, important to be authentic. You know, that is one. Um, you know, some people just get lured by the glamour of um, of someone who is, you know, well-published and, and well-researched and has sort of um, had the quote-unquote limelight. I, I don't think that should be the focus. I think the focus should be um, identifying a person who you think you can work well with and then being respectful of their time is very important. For example, if you, 
um, have committed to finishing a project by a certain date, don't let your mentor have, you know, have, don't let your mentor chase you. It should be the other way around. You should be constantly chasing the mentor. Um, and when it starts to happen the other way around, I think you're doing something wrong. That should never be the case because, you know, you're the one who actually approached them. So you have to value their time. You have to value their commitment and you have to um, be mindful that they have other projects and that if they have given you a project and if they're trying to, if they are investing their effort and time in you, and if they're trying to help you, then you have to do your part in making sure you're punctual and uh, you're following the deadlines and you're getting things done. Um, so that is very, very important. Uh, I think second, it, it, it's always helpful if you like, you know, don't, don't approach someone with like, I want to do research, you know, that, that doesn't help. <laughs> and then it's like, okay, what kind of research do you want to do? What are your interests? And that's not someone who has given enough thought into what they want to do. Um, you know, I would, for example, if, you know, if you, if you want to work with me, you would have researched on what I've done on what I've written. And what are some of the topics that excite me? And then I would, and then you would identify lacunas or uh, areas in some of those topics, which I've written on. And then you would say, you know, Hey, um, you know, I was reading some other papers and, you know, this could be an, 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 an interesting question to answer, which has not been answered. Um, or, you know, coming up with a novel topic for a meta analysis, cause I've written several of them. Um, I think would be would be like okay you know this person has looked me up has done some research on what I've I've done uh, he's seeking my mentorship and he's sort of done the homework on what I've I've done so that it uh, you know um, what he or she wants to do and what I do matches so that I can be an effective mentor and then um, you know has done some homework in you know how to analyze this and how to get this done. You know, some basic literature search, basic PubMed search, basic uh, looking up the articles and, you know, having a bibliography. I think if someone has done all of that, you know, that, that just tells me, okay, they're serious. They want to get this done. And, you know, those are the ones who usually get, get the work done. And, you know, that's how we move projects forward. Um, but I think, it, you know, a lot of like so many of them, I can't even tell, like upwards of 80% of them would write a generic email and producing themselves and saying, I, you know, I'm really impressed with what you've done and I, you know, I look up to you and all of that is good. You know, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm grateful that I, 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 I am in a position where I can inspire that in people. I, I don't know if I am worthy of it, but, you know, I'm grateful that I am in that position. Um, and then if you want to work with me, sure, I'm, I'm more than happy and willing to work with you. Um, but then just don't say, you know, I want to do research. You know, that is that tells me, okay, you know, you, you, there is some, there is some finessing that needs to happen here. Um, I think th that that'll be a big advice for me if you, when you're seeking out mentors, because, you know, mentors are looking for mentees who will get things done. Trust me. Uh, you know, we can't do everything ourselves. It is impossible to do that. Um, so, and we want to work with people who are, who are enthusiastic, right? Who are like-minded, who want to move the field forward, who, um, the more the merrier, you know, the more like-minded people you can find to work with, I mean, the, the merrier. Um, uh, it's just that, um, so we are, we are looking for people who, who will, who will push things forward. Um, but you just have to do that homework so that, you know, you have the mentor interested and hooked and now you are, um, you know, working, working together and doing things together. Yeah, that's that's awesome advice. Actually, I I really appreciate that, and 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 I agree. What you're saying is that just do your background, you know, uh, research before you approach someone, and like maybe come up with a pico score on pico question about about, about what you want to ask them before you just approaching them with a generic question. Yeah. So that's yeah. absolutely yeah. Th thank you, thank you for uh, saying that so succinctly. Uh, so last, lastly, I just want to ask you this question. Uh, what do you think the role of uh, IMGs is in the American healthcare system, especially cardiology? So it's huge. Um, it's huge because uh, I think we form, uh, I can't say that for cardiology per se, but I think if you look at the healthcare workforce in general, I think we are like 50% if you put all the nationalities together. And I think it's important because um, the American population is is getting more diverse as we speak so i think if it's important for outcomes it's important for health outcomes it's important for patients from different backgrounds um 
to be able to, um, you know, have cardiologists and other healthcare providers who they can identify with at least ethnically. Um, so I think we fulfill um, an important lacuna in the American healthcare um, industry, you know, for lack of a better word. Um, and we offer services to to American people where, um, you know, services were not being offered before or services have not been offered traditionally. Um, so we, I think it's an, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's quintessential that our contribution to the American healthcare workforce is, is crucial, is quintessential. I, I think the, the vehicle of American healthcare workforce will collapse if IMGs were to like all leave, say for example, tomorrow, the healthcare industry will collapse. It's it, that, that, that is the significance of the contribution of uh, international medical graduates and foreign graduates to the American healthcare system. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chandra. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, and for more videos like this, please follow us uh, on Twitter at Fits on the Go uh, and also on YouTube. You're at youtube.com slash Fits on the Go.